pessoal. First of all, I want to thank uh, Inês and Dr. Tânia for providing this session. When I saw this panel, I was astonished and realized that I'm not crazy as I thought I was by putting literature and archaeology together. In second place, my English is not fluent or native. Actually, it's a huge challenge to be here. So maybe we will notice some grammar and spelling mistakes, but I swear that I'm working hard on it. Now I'm going to skip to this little notes to say that this poster is divided into four parts. Uh, first of all, it's a brief presentation of A Breath of Life, uh, the last novel right, written by Clarice Lispector. Uh, the intersection between literature and archaeology. The archaeology of know-how that I'm going to display a little. Uh, and for testing some process. Okay. One. Following my literature personality, because I'm a PhD student in literature, I'd like to start my presentation with an epigraph. A book is a situation, but also a situation is a book. Uh, it's a quote from Charlie Jackson. From this quote, I'd like to highlight the word situation. And what is the situation that brings me to this quote as word? My situation is this book, A Brief of Life from Soco de Vida, written by a Brazilian author who you probably know called Clarice Lispector. The book was published in 1968 and, okay, A Brief of Life, Clarice sorry. And this is the first edition and the last one and the, the edition in English. And it was published in 1968 and this information may look like a detail, but it's quite fundamental to the book's own situation, which is... Clarice has died in 1977, is that right? Okay, the year before. So, her last novel was organized, edited, and published by her closest friend after her death, which means this book is posthumous. Actually, this is very common in the literature field, the unfinished romance. But, just a couple of years ago, Inspector's family donated the manuscript of A Brief of Life, and then the, and that's when my problem started. When you proceed with a comparative approach between the book published and the manuscript, it's flagrant how the text was deeply modified by her friend. In fact, there's no book. The book that we see on shelves, the book that has been studied by many scholars for the last five decades was invented by a person who was not the real author. All that we have from Brief of Life is these little pieces, pieces of paper with pieces uh, of narratives. And just a couple of them. And it's a kind of 700 little pieces of little narratives. Uh, with any other, and this is my problem, a huge volume of glorious nothing. And this is Clarice, and this is my face too, it's her in the last interview, cause that's my problem. What can I do? Where? How can I start? How? Second. Many of you will recognize this area, I've moved to Portugal two years ago to do my PhD uh, at the University of Coimbra. And it was my first time in Portugal. A friend of mine gently said, you must go to Coimbra Monographic Museum. And that visit was to one of the main archaeological sites in Portugal has changed my life as a research. Crossing the highways full of pieces of iron and ceramics from the 9th century, I fell stuck 
in front of this specific shelf, stuck, stopped, staring at this ceramics fragment. Quite obvious for you, but very epiphanic for me. They are fragments, and they were not put, just put together, create some object, because they are different. And those are also my fragments. Each of each one is different and singular. Each one of them was compacted on, in one big piece, one book, under one title. At this point, I kind of found in archaeology a possible way to organize my own fragments and started to attend the seminar. Um, an analysis of raw materials with Professor Dr. Costera, Ricardo Costera. And last summer, I had the opportunity to enjoy an excavation in Coninga, the same place where everything began for me. And here's some steps from uh, the process with washing the pieces and describing and organizing the, them, putting some technical place and my goal with this experience was to observe the archaeological process, the backstage work, until I got my I got back to my starting point. The visible point of the silence work, which is uh, an exhibition in this case or uh, an edition in my in literary case. Three. Until then, archaeology for me was very present. In many of you probably already know Michael Foucault, and that published L'Archéologie du Savoir, uh, Archaeology of Knowledge. And but in that book, Foucault <coughs> investigates how a statement is composed, and kind of the archaeology of thoughts. Uh, and the archaeology here is used as a sort of metaphor, and I'm not interested in that, but I'm interested in the practice. So I'm kind of proposing the archaeology of knowledge doing, which is a, a joke that works in, Portu in Portuguese, Archaeologia de Saber Fazer, and I'm kind of stuck in this, translate that to, so it's a, an idea. But what's important to me in archaeology of knowledge doing, uh, there's some questions and these follow, following questions actually have to sustain my interest. How does archaeology treat its ceramics fragments? How are they characterized, documented and registered? What social inference can be made from the objects? How not create a false object? Because the A Breath of Life, the book, is a kind of a false object. And this is the, the field of the archaeology of knowledge doing. And for at this moment, I'm feeling a bit more comfortable navigating through my 700 pieces of paper, applying some practice that I saw in archaeology and proceeding step by step. Uh, I'm starting to think and collection or excavation, uh, understanding the context where the manuscript was written and so my my field, my, my excavation is inside of archives. And second point, kind of washing process that I cannot wash in paper, of course. But uh, the part important for me here is pay attention to the borders, uh, not the piece, but the paper. Because Clarice use uh, scratched leaves to write but also she writes and then scratches the page. So this movement is ambiguous and I, I have to see each one of them to try to 
read these borders. Uh, three sorting or something like that. Um, I kind of organized these manuscripts in three groups. First, it's I'm calling originals because uh, there is no doubt the writing is related to romance. In this case, uh, I highlighted that this name Angela. It is a she is a the main character character. So there's no doubt that Angela belongs to a breath of life. The second group of uh, is residual, which means the text is related to the manuscript, to, to romance, but also have another notations. So it's um, okay. And the third group is infiltrate. The text is clearly unrelated to the romance. For example, this one, um, she writes cream and corn and nothing else. It's not related to romance at all. The first step is marking. Each page has a code in a way that can be combined and dispersed and then put together again. And registering. Give to each manuscript uh, a kind of okay. We can uh, we can photograph them, we can describe them, and we can also uh, draw. Them. And I'm trying to do this to with my manuscripts, so everyone was uh, I, I take photos of everyone and I'm trying to transcribe everyone and then send represent graphical representation of their information in a page. And my fourth, in order to describe and organize the huge amount of manuscripts in a more technical way, is not just a taxonomic mania, but I'm convinced that the archaeology process have practice useful to editorial problems, such as the one that I'm facing. In other words, I turn to a material analysis to extract the book from fragments. And I reinforce that this is a speculation, an exercise of an ongoing project, and I'm sure it needs conceptual and theoretical adjustment, but I'm glad to share this thought looking forward to hear some ideas and remarks from you. So thank you.